Today on Mic Attempts, restoring a bench grinder. I was dropping off some trash at the dump when I saw this 8 inch bench grinder sitting by a dumpster. So of course, I threw it in my trunk. It's looking pretty rough. The guards are bent like it's been dropped. It has a homemade tool rest, and the right side grinding wheel is oddly out of round. It's a Black & Decker 10 amp, 3 quarter horsepower Model 74, made in the USA. The good news is, after chipping off the deposit from the tool rest, the wheels spin freely. Let's get into it. There's decades of grinding dust buildup stuck to the inside of the guards. and more inside the tool rest. The left end of the shaft is reverse threaded, so instead of righty-tighty, it's righty-loosey. The wiring seems pretty straightforward. I've got plans for a grounded power cord, so I'm gonna get rid of the electrical box on the back. But before I go any further, I wanna make sure the motor works. I have it temporarily wired for testing. And with the help of my safety stick, we got nothing. To rule out the switch, I removed it and twisted the wires together for a quick test. Nice, it's working. The bearings are a bit noisy though. These old switches are usually really well made, and this one sounds good. The problem is, the switch housing is secured with two rivets, so I'll need to drill those out to get inside. I carefully removed only the top part of each rivet. Now I can figure out how the switch functions and hopefully fix it. In the off position, this piece is pressed down which breaks the electrical connection below. After racking my brain, I came up with this method of cleaning the contacts. With the plate pressed down, I could insert the bare wire in between the contacts. I eased up on the plate a bit to put a little pressure on the wire while moving it back and forth. I repeated this numerous times on each of the four contact points and then blew everything clean with compressed air. I reassembled the switch using thin machine screws to replace the rivets. I added thread locker, snugged down the nuts, and trimmed off the excess. I had to buy a new tool to pull the inside wheel clamps off the shaft. These parts are keyed. With those out of the way, I can remove the wheel guards. Thank you. 
Next, I remove the long bolts that hold the body together. Then the base. This yellow tube is the start capacitor. These black wires from the stator are secured to copper rings with brass screws. The electric motor looks fantastic, nice and clean. I'm not sure what this ring is called, but there's a carbon brush that rides on the inside, so I assume it's acting like a commutator. It's held in place with a few screws. Looks like there's one more plate at the bottom. My new puller is already coming in handy again. I realize this isn't the proper tool for removing bearings. However, they were pretty loose on the shaft and I wasn't planning on reusing them anyway. That is, until I realized they could be opened and re-greased. I used a small flathead screwdriver to pry up on the inside edge of the metal disc so I could grab it with some thin needle nose pliers. I kept prying along the inner edge while pulling up with the pliers. Then I was able to pull the metal disc towards the center and up to release. The paper and felt discs came out easily. I repeated the process for the final metal disc. There's still some grease in there, but not much. The other side is a standard metal shield that isn't easy to remove without causing damage. There's rust behind the top ID plate, but I'm going to remove them both to make painting easier. They're riveted on, so I'm going to drill them out from the back. Then I can just tap them out the rest of the way with a punch. I let the ID plates and bearings take a ride in the ultrasonic cleaner. Now it's time for my favorite part, paint prep. Prepping and paint are easily the worst parts of almost any project. They're cleaning up nicely. All of the bigger pieces got the same treatment with the angle grinder.
I did the awkward sections and the smaller pieces on the bench grinder. The wire wheel wasn't great at removing all the caked on grinding dust inside the guards, so I broke out the needle scaler. It's all about the right tool for the job. I finished up with some help from the die grinder. I think I used almost every suitable tool at my disposal to get these parts ready for paint. I even used my Dremel and some tiny wire brushes to get in the nooks and crannies. The wheel clamps are badly chipped, so I'm just going to take down the high spots. I used the press in an attempt to straighten out the bent guards. Not perfect, but much better. Then I wiped each piece down with acetone and painted everything. I looked everywhere online for a replacement tool rest, but no luck. The previous owner's homemade rest isn't horrible, but I think I can do better. While constantly reminding myself that I need to make a mirror image of the original guard, I carefully scribed some measurements on a piece of scrap steel and cut it out on the bandsaw. Then I got a little ahead of myself and made the first bend in my press brake. I went very slowly and kept checking the angle against the original until it was like baby bear's porridge. Just right. I messed up the order of operations. It would have been easier to drill the holes needed to create the slot first. Oh well. I know it's partially my unsecured vice. But what's the best method for chain drilling to create a slot? When I tried drilling between two holes, the bit would start wandering off center. Then it would either bind up or start to flex more than I was comfortable with. Which led to a lot more work with the file. This end is 90 degrees, so that bend was simple. I set the angle for the center bend on my T-bevel and kept bending and checking until it matched. Because I'm bending the steel, the dimensions are off a bit from the original, but I was able to match the angles well. I cut a plate for the front of the rest and bent it to fit. I used the original rest to transfer the holes. 
I picked up a cross slide vise that'll make lining up the holes much easier. Again, not perfect, but you're watching Mike attempts. I'm doing my best here. After making the final cuts to accommodate the grinding stone, it's ready to weld. I'm not sure if you've seen any of my other videos, but I'll never claim to be a good welder. That's why angle grinders were invented, right? Now I need to make the thick wedge at the bottom of the tool rest. I had the same problem chain drilling this piece, but it was much more of a hassle to file because of the thickness. With help from my jigsaw, I eventually got there, but I didn't enjoy the journey. I needed one more thin piece to match the thickness of the original. Surprisingly, it didn't go much smoother, but through the magic of editing, I'll save you from watching any more filing. I just need to grind the edges down into a wedge. Once I was happy with the shape, I joined the three pieces with JB Weld. I was afraid that I left the bearings in the ultrasonic cleaner too long, because it really took the shine out of the surfaces. So I ordered the closest bearings I could find. Problem is, I don't think they're wide enough, so I'm going to repack the original bearings and see how they sound. I tracked down some high quality grease that's meant for electric motor bearings. I'm aware of the packing method where you put a glob in your palm and press the edges of the bearing into the grease. However, I'm pretty confident that these bearings have been adequately repacked. Reassembling the bearing shield was pretty straightforward, except for the final metal disc. I figured out that I had to start by pushing one end down into the bearing while prying up on the other end. It rolls smooth and quiet. I had forgotten how loose these bearings were on the shaft. Once past the key slot, there's no resistance. The odd thing is that the shaft doesn't appear to be worn where the bearing sits. I decided to use some Loctite 545 to prevent the bearings from spinning on the shaft. Meanwhile, that copper ring had been catching on the brush since I first disassembled the motor. When it broke off, I thought this restoration was scrapped. 
I finished with the bearings anyway, and then tried to find a replacement for this spring-loaded post. At first, I couldn't figure out how this brush worked. I tested the post for continuity, but nothing. It appeared to be plastic. I couldn't find a replacement, so I glued it back together with some JB Weld. I was hoping for the best, and it wasn't until much later that I finally realized how it works. There are two separate copper rings, and this single brush rides on both at the same time. There are two wires coming from the stator. One wire connects to one ring, while the other wire connects to the second ring. The brush makes the electrical connection between the two copper rings. Maybe all that was obvious to you, but it took me a while to catch up. The Loctite has cured and the bearings are tight on the shaft. Time to reassemble. I gently pressed in the first bearing, secured the metal plate, and then the copper ring. These two spring shims were in the opposite end. I cleaned up some of the surface rust on the outside of the stator housing and then gave it a coat of clear paint. The insulation on these old wires was so stiff that I had to use a heat gun to straighten them out. I decided to add a piece of foam rubber to protect the wires from rubbing on the cover held in place with some hot glue. I used a piece of paper towel to hold the tiny brass screws to the end of the screwdriver. After a ridiculous amount of time and definitely no cussing, both screws are in. I tucked the wires out of the way and pressed everything together. Reinstalling the center piece of sheet metal was a bit tricky but it eventually snapped into place. I screwed on the base and reconnected the wires. Here's the new ground wire. After the unknowns of the brush repair, that was music to my ears. I tightened down the feet to secure the bottom plate. Reassembly seemed to go really smooth. I was pretty happy with myself. Until... These bolts go through holes in the stator housing and I failed to make sure they were perfectly lined up when pressing the pieces back together. I had to disconnect the wiring, remove the base, and rotate the two outer covers just a tiny bit and now all the bolts are in. I reinstalled the guards, wheels, and tool rests. I filled in those welding imperfections with some JB Weld, and I think my homemade rest turned out well. Fully reassembled, it looks pretty sharp. To test the grounded plug, I set my multimeter to continuity, pressed one probe to the ground prong, and confirmed continuity by touching any bare metal. After over three months of working one to two days per week, this grinder, which was thrown out for a faulty switch, is fully restored. Feel free to rate this video, add your comments and questions below, and subscribe for more.